So please welcome our two speakers, Anna Echterhölter and Andreas Wolfsteiner. Please come to the stage. Hey. Great to have you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Barbara. Thank you so much for the nice introduction, Barbara. I would say good morning, but I've seen some of you just having a fully-fledged lunch, so I expect uh, our audience to be from all kinds of different time zones. Welcome, anyhow. It was about 11 years ago when we both met in a research unit called the Transformations of Chronology. It was about time and measurement, comparing Hebrew and African calendar variations, and time deviations, we were faced with a sudden deep dive into the realm of correction, errors, and all kinds of temporal disinformation. Because um, it is no surprise, time recording systems are hugely out of sync there in history. They do not fit, um, just as metric systems and currency systems are not as commensurable as we are used to nowadays. We soon came across the question, in how far systematic errors and non-systematic errors in a wide range of work practices must be classified as a crucial part of productive agency. And this is uh, with John Burry, uh, he put it in 1920 in his publication on the idea of progress, for example. So in the next 15 minutes, we are going to show how far errors measurement, and human bodies practices become increasingly entangled, how errors shape the corporal sphere, and how in return, technological, animal, and corporate bodies are subject to a hygiene of error. Well, in this conference, many uh, advanced contributions will deal with the state of current affairs or future projects, probably. We aim to historicize one particular strand, and this is, of course, about data. Yeah? Especially those data produced in measurement of human bodies, motions, and practices. And we thought it very fitting, too, to open today's discussion on the art of error with two examples of wrong measurements. So what we're going to do um, is to show you four takes, and these four takes on thurblings, goats, on sin and pain, and on error scenarios um, are connected in that, that there's just one thing is off. It's not a standard measurement. And something is imperfect, imprecise, overzealous, or even catastrophic about them. Um, and this is all in the line of a history of data. So although it appears that machines and other technological entities nowadays become more and more intimate and human. We think that the root directories of our society at the same time become increasingly more um, relying on, on data measurement and um, on, on more rigid cores. So that's, that's the surface and core uh, lines that we're going to try to explore in these four takes. During the First World War, at the end of 1915, Frank Bunker Gilbreth published an article titled Motion Study for the Crippled Soldier in the journal of the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. Therein, he defines work processes as, quote, cycle of decisions and motions arranged in varying sequences, end of quote. According to the analysis, a total of 16 elementary types, wait a little more, called <coughs> Thurblicks can be found. Thurblicks is just the name Gilbreth phonetically in reverse. Among tasks like search, find, select, grasp, position, assemble, basic practical error can be found as avoidable delay. You can see it, it's this little guy here lying down on his back. This last category of movement stands out since it signifies the unforeseen absence of motion, the outright denial 
to carry on. It is a symbol of halt, of interception, and exhaustion. It seems to be more critical compared to the others. The category clearly comprises the employer's perspective, whose sole objective is an optimum efficiency of motion. But how long a time span? Let's take a quick look at an error measurement setting. The Gilbreths tried out in the year 1916. The image you see depicts then famous Margaret Benedict Owen, the world's fastest typist. In a typing convention in 1916, she reached a new record. In an hour-long contest, she would write a total of 7,925 words, which sums up to 18 standard pages. And that's equal to 125 words a minute on an Underwood machine. And there's an interesting part. The net words after deducting error were 7,495 words. That's a total of 430 false words. And that's pretty exactly, if you want to imagine it, one norm page out of 18 pages total. The error rate of Margaret Benedict Owen accounts with a clear 0.054%. I read that out for you. The main thing is, it's interesting because that's a density that you would expect in better tested software nowadays. The main thing is that Owen was on the one hand coached by another tailorist called Charles E. Smith, and on the other hand underwent error observations within the experimental setting of Gilbreth in order to analyze, predict, and prevent error in her emotional cycle of typing. Gilbreth, in one of his analytic movies even claims to have changed the arrangement of the keys on the machine in order to prevent avoidable delay due to a defective motion cycle on the part of Margaret Owen. Margaret Owen comments on her writing experience as follows. For a year, I diligently copied from morning till night. My fingers became more supple, my nerves more settled, my method more daring. It was at this time that I discovered I wrote mechanically. Page after page, I copied, my fingers virtually reading the copy mechanically. The minute I took place before my typewriter, I forgot the crowd and the cheering. If ever an inanimate object came to life, it was my machine." End of quote. In this concrete, third-blick arrangement we see Margaret Owen set it in, we observe the beginnings of an intrusion, an intrusion of the data sphere into manual and behavioral patterns. This marks the advent of a post-Fordist climate. An emphasis on data collection about single motions of the head, the hand, and finally, the mind. The data collected in the setting that shows Margaret Owen has today become a commodity. No longer are online products in the focus of economic assessment. Since data about individuals has become a market in itself, a stage that could be qualified as data capitalism, as described by Sarah Myers West, in the way that Thurblicks form an alphabet for the possible practices of a worker, this particular material, the information about motion patterns, turns into the current production 
and currency. I give you a counter image. John Menet Keynes once uh, mentioned a case from Uganda, and he did so in his treatise on money. His friend in Uganda, he was a colonial official, and reportedly he was often very bored. Bored by the tedious duties of solving disputes over the quality of animal bodies. Apparently, requests of conflicting parties often urged him to decide upon the quality of the standard goat. Everything of value was measured against a goat standard, which was a very important uh, animal for the farming uh, landscape there. Sometimes goats themselves would change the proprietor, sometimes it was just the unit. Three goats, I give you the value of three goats on this and that day. Goats performed typical monetary functions, and such measures of value, um, such as measure of value or unit of account. And it is by no means an exception, of course. Um, for those of you who like the agrarian world of Homer, cattle here is very, very often used to express value. In some regions of Africa, we even have testimony to units of account that are measured in units of slaves. And uh, from here in the Alps to the North Sea, chicken had to be given on a particular dates to the authorities as dues. And uh, not every animal, of course, was acceptable because these bodies differ. And in order to ascertain that you did not have to deal with a glitchy chicken, there was a test. The animals given had to be capable of flying on a barrel. They had uh, to be motorically fit, in a way. And these quarrels in Uganda, or as well the performance tests for birds, indicate the problem. The bodies of these valuable animals did, of course, not form an exact scale, an exact value scale, and this is um, the point of this uh, take. They led to negotiations, obviously. They led to negotiations about the error in measurement, and this is, of course, completely different from today's world, where everything's smooth, commensurable. Sometimes, you know, there are errors, but in, in, in principle, these scales and these units and these metric systems, they're all in place. So it's easy to say what's wrong in this take. Um, there's an absence of a metric infrastructure. We cannot value um, monetary transactions numerically precisely, right? So we have to use these animal bodies, and of course, um, animal bodies here are just an approximate way of doing things, but a thing that is like globally testified to. Um, just to step back even further, you know, if we're talking about the history of data and we want to start thinking about where did quantification start? Where did it sort of begin? Um, many people point to sin and pain nowadays. This connection of quantification and bodies can be taken to a criminal extreme. In the early Middle Ages, the metric order of the Roman Empire was in decline and decay. Coins became a local affair if they circulated at all. But remarkably, the legal codes that were compiled from the 9th century onwards here in Europe testify to a very widespread system they contained veritable catalogues of degrees in which a body was hurt. They did so with quite stunning detail. Can the eye still hold a tear? Does a healed foot drag through the dew in the morning? These legal compilations produce quite stable quantifications for pain and injury and even death. What is more, they measure every harm done against an expressed value and an exactly expressed value. So here the precision comes in. Um, for example, the most famous equivalent, 200 solidi for the murder of a free man. Of course, killing women or unfree persons uh, could be appeased by a lesser sum of blood money. David Greber's reading of the Irish blood money catalogues emphasizes the important role rank, social strata, played in these listings. 
And lately, there's been a lot of discussion about these errors and criminals in the criminal sense and their influence on the development of value scales. James Aho, for example, analyzes confession and measuring the sin, everyday sins, as a subtly standardized practice, at least in Catholic Church. In the same way, Karl Polanyi suggests, with a Buddhist example, that scales for measuring develop out of the quantification out of moral states of shame. I quote, punishment approximation when the process of riddance of guilt is quantified. So it's not the guilt itself, it's getting rid of it. So there's this complex of debt and shame um, that has to be sort of managed by sin and um, prayer, obviously. Stable systems are derived from harmed bodies criminal injustice, and tormented minds. So that was my take. In the next step, can you hear me? In the next step, we're going to skip about 1,000 years and outline what coping with error looked like in the second half of the 20th century. In order to ensure the maximum of error cancellation and delay avoidance, the practice of scenario analysis emerges at the beginning of the Cold War around the 1950s. The use of this practice at that time is underscored as a part of the strategic plans after the onset of the Korean War. Scenario analysis evolved to be a well-established approach, an approach that shaped our understanding of erroneous future developments and cultural malfunctioning like no other. At the end of the 1960s, scenario planning becomes a common practice in the arising simulation economy, for example, in national insurance companies, in climate research, in market and structural analysis, in ergonomics, in organization, as well as management theory. As a crude mixture of improvisational gaming, role play, and raw statistical analysis carried out by the infamous Rand Corporation, they develop a tool to foresee possible futures, more or less precisely, without any imperfections. A group of consultants, the press dubbed the Megadeth intellectuals, defined scenarios, and that's very similar to Gilbert's motion cycle, and I quote them, hypothetical sequences of events constructed for a purpose of focusing attention on causal processes and decision points for preventing, diverting, or facilitating possible errors. End of quote. This snippet is taken from the book The Year 2000, a framework for speculation on the next 33 years, written by Herman Cain and Arthur J. Wiener in 1967. As Louis Menon put it, in, put it in his analysis, Herman Cain and the nuclear war, the margins of error in futurist writings can be staggering. And indeed, not seldomly will you find phrases, preferably hidden in footnotes, that sound like this, and I quote Kane, given the uncertainties, the problem could conceivably be five times or worse, end of quote. Despite these breathtaking uncertainties, scenarios deliver robust results concerning a thinking of the unthinkable, as Kane put it. Although 50%, roughly, of the predictions are wrong, but they do preconceive of achievements like home computers, artificial organs and limbs, pages, and, quote, perhaps even two-way pocket phones, end of quote. On the other hand, the year 2000 came, and still there were no noiseless helicopters instead of cab cars, no artificial moons in the sky to illuminate the cities. And concerning labor, well, there is still no 13-week vacation, is there? In the article, scenario, uncharted waters ahead, 1985, Pierre Wack, an official of Royal Dutch Shell, who had risen to fame when he predicted the oil crisis of 1973 via scenario planning, puts it like this, and I quote him. 
since the early 1970s. However, forecasting errors have become more frequent and occasionally of dramatic and unprecedented magnitude. They are usually constructed on the assumption that tomorrow's world will be much like today. They often work because the world does not change. But sooner or later, will fail when they are needed most." End of quote. Good, so why these four worlds of quantification? Why did we pick these examples, these particular bodies, these particular measurements? <coughs> For one, we claim that it's important to remember how strongly bodies are entangled with this new, newly developing data infrastructures and metric infrastructures, these metric ecologies that we're immersed in. The Thurblick, the diligent Mrs. Owen and her typewriting machine, uh, was the best example for eradicating error and how that um, afflic afflicted her. Data interfere with the man-machine behavior, and um, this model of Mrs. Owen may become very ubiquitous. The goat showed the opposite. We just wanted to remind everybody that there was times where this precision wasn't, was not available. So it's some kind of failure of precise infrastructure. It's not readily uh, measurable. And these times, bodies become the standards or serve as value standards themselves. With sin and pain, we wanted to show that these quantifications, people are discussing that these quantifications may emerge from sin and pain and these uh, blood money catalogs. And with the error scenarios, we wanted to, to show that it's not statistics. When they're real great problems, wars, catastrophes, and the prediction of those is not left to statisticians, but these mixed media practices of scenarios where the body or role play comes in again. Just as earlier organizational theory maintained that humans become the environment of practices, we now have to face situations where we may become environmental or marginal to data streams and data circulation. Thank you. Thank you.